Amsan against Jeskai, Takemura against Tamada, Japan versus Japan. Let's find a champion of Pro Tour Battle for Zendikar. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night wherever you are around the world. Welcome to the final of Pro Tour Battle for Zendikar, coming to you live from Milwaukee in the United States here in Wisconsin. Rich Hagen alongside Pro Tour historian Brian David Marshall and the Hall of Famer Louis Scott Vargas. You are all welcome. So let's get to it. Who wins the championship in this best three out of five matchup? First up, we have this man. There you see him, Kazuyuki Takamura. He is playing an Abzan list. He is in his fifth Pro Tour. He's twice been knocking on the door, but now he is into the top eight and into the final. Or will it be the other Japanese player here in the final, Ryoichi Tamada? He is playing Jeskai. This is his tenth Pro Tour since Amsterdam in 2010. By far his best performance. And now we get ready to go at it. Brian David Marshall, what a final we have in store. Yeah, it's uh, Mantis Riders versus Siege Rhinos. Both players have opened up on two copies of their sort of tra you know flagship card. And uh, who wins in that fight, Luis? Well, usually it's a pretty close fight. In this particular case, Tamada on the draw has kept a two-land hand. So there's a chance that he doesn't play a spell on his third turn, in which case he'd be significantly behind. But it's, it's a pretty close race. Basically... Whoever has removal tends to have the edge there, and Siege Rhino in general does win the race, just because you know, it drains for three when it comes into play. It, it's kind of like its version of haste, except it also gains you three life. So Takamura has the first non-land play of the game. It's a hangerback walker. You're going to see plenty of those over the course of the next uh, hour or a little bit more. As Tamada tries to work out where he goes on turn number two. He did find that third land. Yeah, and importantly, it was a windswept teeth, which is a white source that comes into play untapped. So now Seeker of the Way is going to hit on turn two for Tamada. So we're going to have a, a, a good game here. You know, both players have two drops. Both players have three drops. And it's actually possible that the Siege Rhinos don't show up right on time either because now it's actually Takimura who, who might be missing his, his drop it. You know, yeah, for he, his marquee card. Right, he, he's got one flooded strand in his hand, and that, that's the end of his lands. He's got a Warden of the First Tree, a Dramokus Command, and two Siege Rhinos. And, you know, the way Tomata has constructed his deck with those four Jeskai charms, something I've mentioned frequently because I, I think it's very good. Well, he's played them frequently. <laughs> yes, is uh, if, if uh, you know, Takimura misses a land drop here, expect those Jeskai charms to aggressively put Hangar back back on top, and that that's a huge edge. Mm. And Mantis Rider just inherently comes down earlier, and not just by a turn, but sort of by two turns because it gets to attack straight in. So. But it gets sent back in time a turn by the Siege Rider, is that uh, what Luis yes. was saying? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, Dramoka's command is actually going to make a play here, too. And in this case, unlike in the Obzon Mirror, Takimura is, is happy letting his hanger back survive. Yeah. We saw Paul Dean in, in this exact same spot, essentially, chose to get two one on flyers instead of having the 3-3 three, three hanging right, back. Right, said, said chose the mode of sacrifice and enchantment when there were no enchantments in play. So this is a, this is a big turn, though. You know, even if Takimura misses, he's got it on land. He's got another Dramoka's command in hand, it looked like. So he, he would be able to he does. spend his turn killing the Mana Strider, though he might still do that, even though he did draw the, the fourth land here. But he can still advance his board, play a uh, Warden, and cast Ramuka's Command. Yeah, I, I, I think he's just going no. <laughs> smash, play a Siege Rhino. Uh, again, how many times in this tournament do you think players have had the option of casting a Siege Rhino and declined to do so? My guess is not very, <laughs> not very many. <laughs> and two basic lands, so the Battle Land comes into play. Untapped. And constructing your mana base so that you not only have your, you know, lands like Windswept Teeth or Wooded Foothills get the right colors because they can touch other colors thanks to the Battlelands, but making sure your Battlelands also come into play untapped the majority of the time. That, that's one of the, the skills in this new format, and I think both players have navigated that well, though. As you see, Tomato just has three basic lands in play. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the best 
uh, possible situation. You get bonus points for that, right? Well, might see another Mantis Rider buzzing over here. We're going to see a lot of attacks and a lot of no blocks <laughs> so far. Uh, I mean, Tomata can block, double block, like Siege Rider, for example, but that's just so risky in the face of any removal spell. And you are you are winning the race, especially with Jeskai Charm in hand, because Jeskai Charm has another mode, the, the least used mode of plus one, plus one, <laughs> and lifelink, which that leads into a 16-point life swing with those two Mantis Riders. Such, such a pretty card in gameplay as well as just the art. Is it time for another Siege Rider to come down, or is this time to, to Dromoko's Command? I refer you to your earlier comment. How often have players had the opportunity? <laughs> da, 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 da. Uh, well, this might actually be one of those turns. Th there we go. If 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 Takimura was going to Dramoka's command, he would presumably have done it before damage to get an extra damage on his attacker, unless he wants to make his warden a four four. He can like play warden, level it up, and then Dramoka's command, in, which is what I think he's. It, he might be leaning towards doing that, but kind of like just dropping siege rhino here. Pretty hard to imagine that that not working out. <laughs> With a smoldering marsh, I, I think, being the target for Wooded Foothills here. So because Wooded Foothills can get smoldering marsh or canopy vista, it, it's kind of like a tri land. It, it produces all three colors of mana effectively. Though you do eventually, you do have to lock it in. So it looks like the the warden is going to be buffed at some point here, while Dramoka's command is uh is having the siege rhino or or, or potentially actually the hangar back to make three tokens, and this puts. And this puts Takimura really out of range of dying because now he's got three one on flying blockers as well as soon to be a four four warden and a four five siege rhino with you know even a sizable life point advantage and another siege rhino in hand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this is this is not going Tomato's way. We, we can put it that way. So Tomato draws plenty of cards in hand, but not plenty of time to utilize them. Another treasure cruise. Tomata could attack with Mantis Rider, and if it gets triple blocked, plus one, plus one in lifelink, end up at 10 life, which isn't lethal. He would then, unfortunately for him, die, die to the <laughs> die attack to the plus rhino. the second Siege Rhino, uh. but I, I don't think you're in a position to play around the second Siege Rhino. Putting a s Warden back on top doesn't seem like it's going to work out. S especially since his opponent had the opportunity to play a Siege Rhino and didn't take it. Yeah. <laughs> that does conceal such things. So I think that the the conservative route probably was better of just killing the Vanish Rider and not running into one of the quad Jeskai charms. So now, but has got a Jeskai charm. He he's not technically dead if he if he Jeskai charms the warden. So he could. Uh, block one of the tokens and fall to one. Again, I don't, I, don't, I don't conceive of a universe where he's beating the second Siege Rhino. <laughs> In a close game, the second Siege Rhino is usually the death knell. And Jeskai charming a Siege Rhino back on top is not an enviable position. It's been done, I'm sure. Oh, I've certainly seen it happen. It just, it's just not the place you want to be. And I like the no attack on Shambling Vent. I think that uh, Shambling Vent should probably remain remain at home for the time being. In we go with the team. Warden of the First Tree, Siege Rhino, two Flyers. They are not hanging back. They are in. And Takamura, just the one lonely Mantis Rider to get in the way. So Warden goes away. But there's another Warden, yeah. uh, another Siege Rhino, and that's game. So Kazuyuki Takamura leads by 1-0 to zero of, over his compatriot Ryuichi Tamada. Jeskai against Abzan. It is the Siege Rhinos and the Abzan deck that leads by 1-0. to zero. We will be right back with more of this final after these messages. Put your game to the test at a Grand Prix. These open tournaments feature the best players in your region as well as top Magic pros. Upcoming Grand Prix include Beijing, Quebec City, Porto Alegre, Lyon, and Indianapolis. Visit magic.wizards.com slash Grand Prix for a complete schedule. Start on your road to the Pro Tour by playing in a preliminary Pro Tour qualifier. With more than 2,000 locations running events, you're sure to find one near you. 
Visit magic.wizards.com slash PPTQ for schedules and information. So you see what is sometimes the most magnificent, sometimes the loneliest seat in the world. It is the final here of Pro Tour Battle for Zendikar. Our two Japanese players, Kazuyuki Takamura and Ryuichi Tomada, are going at it. And it is Takamura with his Abzan list, who leads by 1-0. to zero. So why don't we take a look, gentlemen, at the sideboard. Here is Kazuyuki Takamura's board. One, Sorin Solemn Visitor. Two, Tasuga the Golden Fang. A single Wingmate Rock. Two Duress, one Self-Inflicted Wound, three Silk Wrap, three Transgress the Mind, and we finish off with two Ultimate Price. So, Luis, any sense of what the Abzan wants to do against Jeskai? I don't think Abzan is going to fundamentally change its strategy here. Even though we saw Tamada, you know, kind of pull a fast one and swap in Mastery <laughs> the Unseen and a bunch of removal against the Jeskai Mirror, given that Takamura has four Jamoka's commands, I, I don't think he's as worried about that. I don't think he's going to expect uh, Tamada to take out a bunch of his creatures. So I think the removal spells are decent. I think Duress is good. And cards like Wingmate Rock that really get him ahead on the board are, are also pretty good. So Silk Wrap actively bad? No, I, I like Silk Wrap. It hits Jace and Mantis Rider and Seeker of the way. So I think it, it does what you want it to do. And it's not particularly vulnerable to enchant removal because the Jeskai deck just doesn't have any. It right. also hits Hangerback Walker, and Tamada's got four of them. So I would expect to see all the Silk Wraps, the Duress, okay. and the Wingmate Rock come in. So that's Kazuyuki. Do you, you also you don't see the ultimate price. The fact that they miss on Mantis mm -hmm. Rider and Hangerback, I think, okay. makes them too, too risky. It's just enough at that point to take it out of the equation. All right. Uh, what about Ryoichi Tamada? What does he have to work with? Well, again, there is a solitary planeswalker. This time it's Sarkin the Dragon Speaker. Two Arashian Cleric. He's also got a Wingmate Rock. Two Disdainful Stroke and Dispel in the uh, Counter Magic Suite. The two now infamous Mastery of the Unseen that were just magnificent for him uh, in Game 2 of the semi-final against John Finkel. Two Rending Volley to deal with white or blue things. A Roast a Silk Wrap to Surge of Righteousness. Luis. So, because I don't think the whole Mastery combo is coming in, I, I again, expect to see some slight upgrades. Though Disdainful Stroke is quite good against Siege Rhinos and, and uh, Wingmate Rocks and the like. It could even snag a Hangerback Walker if it's, if it's cast for four or more. Other than that, you know, the Jeskai deck is kind of built to be good against this kind of deck, against the Obzon deck. Fiery Impulse may miss some of the time because it really only hits Warden. So you, you do want cards like, you know, Roast, for example, is quite strong. I, I think Wingmate's good on both sides of the matchup. it will be interesting to see if Surge of Righteousness comes in. I don't think it generally does, though it does kill both Siege Rider and Anna Fenza, And, that, you know, that might make it good enough. It kills Shambling Vent, too. So the fact that it hits those three cards, yeah, it might make it, you know, worth including, especially since... Silk Wrap is the kind of card which will, does look pretty good against cards like Hangerback and Offenza Warden. It's just so vulnerable to Jamoka's Command. When you Silk Wrap a Hangerback and you have to sacrifice it to Jamoka's Command, that's fine because the Hangerback comes back as a 0 0. But if you Silk Wrap a creature and then later Jamoka's Command goes like Siege Runner fights your Mana Strider, you sacrifice your Silk Wrap, that's just incredibly bad for the Jeskai deck. Right. So, 1-0 down, Jeskai here uh, against Arbzan. And fundamentally, in game one, we certainly saw, well, I've got a 3-3 three, three that flies. You've got a 4-5 that swaps life by three. Yours is just better. So, wh what is the case for Jeskai winning here? What, uh, what do we look for as the games progress to show Jeskai ahead? Well, one big one is Treasure Cruise. Tomata's got three copies of Treasure Cruise, and... Given that both players have good answers to the other player's creatures, for example, Tomata can just have a draw that involves going, you know, Fire Impulse, your Warden, Valorous Stance, your Siege Rhino, Valorous Stance, your Siege Rhino. All of a sudden, Treasure Cruise is fantastic because neither player's life total is hugely under threat. The other thing is that Mantis Rider plus Jeskai Charm, if you can get ahead, Jeskai is incredibly good at winning for when it's ahead. When it can get slightly ahead, it tends to ride that to victory. In this case, you saw Tomato was on the draw and stumbled on mana. So both those things contributed to him not ever getting ahead. Jeskai is a very hard deck to beat if they have any sort of edge on the battlefield. Okay, so if you are looking for the Jeskai deck uh, to come back in this one, look to be ahead early and see where the Treasure Cruise uh, can get the job done late if most of your early threats are dealt with on a kind of one-for-one -one basis. You see there in the, the center in the Magic the Gathering shirt, that's one of our colleagues from uh, Nico Nico, the team uh, that bring the Japanese language coverage live uh, to that part of the world. And I, I BDM, I, I just can't imagine 
um, what the Japanese community is feeling uh, at the moment. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the last time we had uh, an all Japanese Pro Tour finals. It is. I, I'm pretty sure that I have. I'm going. I'm going to. I haven't looked it up. I'm going to imagine that I have not commentated on one. I don't feel I have since 2009. I think we are we are back into the the realm of sort of 2005 to 2008 when Japan had Player of the Year every year, and it was Kenji Samura and Tomohiro Saito and Shota Yasuoka and Shuhei Nakamura. I feel like that's when. Yeah, no, it, it was it was very likely. it was very much a, a common occurrence throughout uh, throughout the uh, 2005 on. Yeah, you know, in fact, that was you know we we did we talked to Shota Yasuoka who got inducted into the Hall of Fame. He, he was someone who was playing on the Pro Tour and, and, and doing okay, but he, he watched 2005, uh, all, in 2004 and 2005, actually, all those Japanese players doing well. And for him, that was a big inspiration. He's like, oh, you know, I, I think I should be playing this game more seriously. And then a year later, he was the player of the year. <laughs> he won the Magic Online Player of the Year, too, as well. He did, yes. In 2000, 2009, he won Magic Online Player of the Year. Uh, unified the belts. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, talking about other tournaments again. We, we've talked about it a couple times. Uh, Tomato is going to be playing in the World Magic Cup in just a month, alongside Kenji Samura, one of the players who won Player of the Year in 2005, and Yuya Watanabe, who is Rookie of the Year, Player of the Year, Player of the Year, um, everything of the yeah. year. <laughs> just uh, so the, the Japanese team, uh, especially in light of how how good Tomato's looked here, is. Just going to be uh, tremendous at the World Magic Cup. We, we could be seeing maybe that new surge of uh, Japanese magic. Well, after watching both these players play throughout this top eight, I think that no matter who wins, we're going to have a Pro Tour champion who's very good at magic. Yes, right. yes. So they see the opening hand for Tamada. See Jeskai Charm nearest us there on the other side. There's Takamura with his arms on list 1 0 up. Plenty of land to be thinking about there. I wonder whether this might go back on the basis of not enough action. Let's see what Takemura does. Yeah, he's going to say, no, I have to send this away. I think it was five land, two spells, uh, and uh, didn't look like he had much going on. Uh, so small edge uh, to Tomada here. Um, I'm going to hazard a guess that maybe we go all the way back to maybe 2006. Like pretty much Worlds 2006 in Paris when Makahita uh, Mahara wins. Yeah. Uh, I think it was his finals against uh, Rio Agora. Rio Agora, I think. Okay. Yeah, I have a feeling that that because yeah, he, be the he last beat one. And Paulo Vitor Damodorosa and Gabriel Nassif <laughs> en route to the <laughs> finals. <laughs> but that's correct. I'm re so I remember those matches, uh, uh, you know, very distinctly. But yeah. A very, very young Palavita Damodorosa. And here we are almost 10 He's years old. He's still very that. young. Oh, wait, I've just aged no. at the same pace as him. Right. Well, relatively, you're getting closer in age. <laughs> Excellent. So, three land, three spells. That seems perfectly presentable. So let's take a look um, at the top of the deck, see whether that's a scry top, scry bottom. If you're not yet playing the scry rule when it comes to mulliganing, you're meant to be. If you mulligan to less than uh, to anything less than seven, when you decide to keep your hand, you get to look at the top card, and then either leave it on the top so you draw it, or send it to the bottom so you don't. What, what percentage of the time do you successfully scry when you mulligan? Like, have you completely adopted it mechanically into your play play style? Because we've seen a couple players in the top eight forget their scry. Uh, I haven't missed it in in a tournament yet. Uh, okay. I, I've gotten to test it extensively in tournaments, and uh, <laughs> so far I've managed to avoid missing it. Very well practiced. We, 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 we had some incidents in play testing where one player would mulligan, and then the other player would mulligan. Then one player goes to scry, and the other player's like, yeah, I, I guess I should scry also. <laughs> but I think most people have gotten the hang of it at this point. It is actually worth noting that it's better on the draw, because if you, you notice a lot of players have fetch lands. And it, so imagine Takemura was on the play, scryed and saw a card he liked, then had a windswept heath to play that Warden of the First Tree. He would actually lose the scry value there. Mm. But So being on the draw, you avoid that. We're away with Jace Vryn's pro prodigy looking to become a telepath unbound at some stage. By, by the way, Tamada, only those two lands. So it really is, uh, wants that Jace to live. And... You know, he's, he's just hoping that Takamura does not have a Dromoka's Command uh, or a Silkrap yeah. here on turn two. Good news. He doesn't. 
In Warden fact, of the First Tree, Double Wing Mate Rock, Abzan Charm, Flooded Strand, Shambling Vent. So he can't have a 3-3 Warden in play. If, if Takamura likes to, he can crack that Flooded Strand for just a Plains and hit with a 3-3 Warden. He's just looking at what that sets him up for the next turn. And if he doesn't draw land, it's tap Shambling Vent, play another 1-1 one, one Warden, which is not the most impressive turn. But he's not that close to being able to cast anything else anyway, so I, I think that it's very reasonable to, to make a 3-3 three, three here. But in this case, it looks like he really wants to play that Shambling Vent tapped. <laughs> I like the free attack there. <laughs> Warden number two comes down for Takamura. All right, there's a wooded foothills. And now I think Tomata's actually in great shape. He's not missing his third land drop. He gets to sit on Jace, and he gets to play a Just Guy Charm this turn if he wants. He, could, he can just pass with mana up. And he can also just play Hanger Back Walker and leave Fiery Impulse up. That's also quite good. But Just Guy Charm is pretty punishing against an opponent who's mulligan, especially an opponent who might sink some mana into, into the one of these Wardens here. So I think no matter which option Tamada goes with, he's, he's going to be in good shape. And I think he's thinning his deck of a mountain before using Jace here. Because Jace isn't going to flip this turn, so you might as well look at your cards early. Though it could block a 1-1 one, one Warden if you really wanted to incite the, the Warden getting bigger. <laughs> so the, the, that is an argument for not using it yet. But <laughs> finding a Mantis Rider is a pretty big reward. So, But it looks like... Yeah, it is going to be the hanger back walker, sit back on the fire impulse. So uh, sideboarding, as it turns out, was for Takamura, one wing, wingmate rock, three silk wrap, one ultimate price, minus four Gideon, minus one uh, Dramoka's command. So it continues to side out the Gideons. Uh, Tamada, plus one Sarkin, plus one wingmate, plus two disdainful stroke, plus one roast. And he went down two hanger back walkers, two seeker of the ways, and took out a silk wrap. In addition to not bringing in a silk wrap. So, it looks like Takamura is not interested in getting those wardens in. I think he he senses the fiery impulse, and by passing, with all his mana untapped, then he declines to give Tamada an opportunity to fire impulse. Though it looks like he might he might end up doing so here. Well, a little more uh, fetching up action. Just goes and gets a straight planes. So Tamada chose not to use Fire Impulse on his turn, which basically meant it meant that Takamura couldn't activate Warden on his turn. But the net result of that was that Tamada didn't end up using that red mana. So he's kind of down one, you know, use of mana here. So he, I think Fire Impulse is cheap enough that that's not going to be a big cost. But by passing, he, that, that is the, the situation he gets himself into. Graveyard gradually filling for Tamada. You know, it's, a, it's a critical Jace numbers right now. And Cinderglade might actually be the land he gets. It looks like he's, he's, he's pulling out a Prairie Stream, but Cinderglade does let him cast both Just Guy Charm and Fiery Impulse, so clearly that's not, not his plan this turn. But n now Jace is, is in flip mode. If, if Jace gets activated, it will, it will flip. Tomato with a backup Vryn's Prodigy. Fiery Impulse, Jeskai Charm, and Shivan Reef. That's the four he's working with. And I'd like to uh, do some Jace action. Gideon was the card that came off Jace. So now something has to go away. Might be the third copy of Jace here. <laughs> Might also be that uncastable fiery impulse, <laughs> but it, no, it is—it is in fact the backup Jace. So transform. It is telepath unbound now. Looked like he was thinking about maybe the fiery impulse in the sense that I guess he could discard it to flash it back without you know maybe going down a card on the other cards. Is, is that something he was considering? I think I think it might have been, but it looks like plusing Jace on a, on a, a warden and then play. Playing Gideon, making a knight means that uh, kind of the shields are up. 
Tamada saving all of his you know tricky spells for later, and kind of hoping that Takamura doesn't have a big attack this turn. So Absan Charm digs him two cards mm -hmm. deeper. At the cost of what hopefully is two relatively unimportant life. This is not a, a racing game. It's what it's looking like. It is what mm. is looking like it's shaping up to be. We're not seeing Mantis Riders racing Siege Runners. This is more of a can Jason, Gideon, and Hangerback and Good Spells kind of take control of the game. So, yeah, I agree that life totals are not on the forefront of really either player's mind mm. here. We're, we're really more struggling for card advantage and board position. And that board position advantage currently belongs to the man on the right, Ryoichi Tamada. And what, once you see your opponent starting to play, get some Planeswalkers in play, you really are thinking about getting those wingmate rocks on the board. Yeah, wingmate rock is going to be one of the, the mirror breakers here, as really either player who sticks a wingmate rock is going to be reasonably far ahead. Yeah, well, and, I mean, Takamura is sitting on two of them at the moment. And, and that's why he helped on Charm for lands. He, he just He's just looking to try to hit his fourth and fifth land drops, and so far he's succeeded on the fourth, but has yet to find the fifth. You did that without stumbling. I'm very impressed. Well, the other thing that's important is Takamura hasn't shown Tamada yet that he is light on lands. So once he does, I expect that Jeskai Charm to kind of get shuffled to the front of the sure. hand. Sure. Mm. Once you know your opponent's missing a land drop, you gets way more appealing to start blanking their draw steps with Jeskai Charm. Away goes Warden of the First Tree. Looks like both, both Wardens of both trees might be going. <laughs> <laughs> Ow. It's actually not that big of a deal for Takamura here because he's not as worried about his Wardens. He actually, he, his, under his optimal situation, his next turn is spending mana casting Wingmate Rock. Mm. And he's got a backup Warden in his hand. Th this, this comes back to, to your point about the fact that he disguised the fact that he was scuffling for land. Exactly. Because there, there's zero chance he would have killed both of them if he'd known that uh, Takamura really, really needs to have a land come off the top here. And this is a, this is going to be, uh, you know, one of the draw steps for the Pro Tour here. Is it a land? Oh, it was a Siege oh. Rhino. <laughs> Normally you're not like a, <laughs> you just just a Siege said, Rhino. <laughs> yeah, you sounded so upset. Well, oh. it was not nearly as good as a land. No. <laughs> siege Rhino could attack it. The problem is Hangerback's essentially a 2-2, two -two, and four 2-2s two blocking a Siege Rhino. It means you're trading a Siege Rhino for a Seeker of the Way and a token. It's not the end of the world, especially if you expect Gideon's Emblem to be coming out. That's a better trade than you get afterwards, but it's not really what you're hoping in this situation. You're hoping to make that attack and then play a Wingmate Rock and be able to threaten those Planeswalkers. Instead, you can make that attack and then follow it up with another Siege Rhino, I guess. Hmm. Or you could just play a Siege right now. That is also an option. 23, uh, 22 to 10. And this is a case of the, the life totals being a little deceiving. I I, I feel confident that Tomata's ahead this game. For sure. Missing on that fifth land was, was a really big. And, and now that Tomata has seen that, one of the ways he he has to be thinking about this, and you know, given the play he's had so far, I I I think he's a player who would be thinking like this: is how do I lose this game? Wingmate Rock has to be one of the answers to that question. And given that, just guy charming a siege runner might not be the most conventional play. Mm. But you know, I, I don't hate the idea. <laughs> right, you would you would take that three point life drain to prevent your opponent from drawing a land next turn. And, and well, by the way, he still has Jace, so you can do it again. You're plusing two Planeswalkers and plusing a hanger back, so I think it's very reasonable to do. Tomato's going to pass on that. He might be setting up a Jeskai Charm plus one, plus one, and lifelink here, which is also going to be oh, very good. boy. Isn't it just... So it might actually be just just close to lethal next turn, because you're going to end up... Because you can... Gideon Emblem, you end up with a 5-5 five, five Mana Strider, a 5-5... Four, four, five, five, uh, Seeker of the Way, and a bunch of 4-4 four, four Knights and a, a giant hanger back, and then the land comes into play tapped. <laughs> yeah, every chance we're looking at 1-1 one, one here pretty soon. All signs point in that direction.
Takuma are still with just four mana available, despite seeing land number five. Warden lets Takamura leave up the ultimate price he has in his hand, which can at least kill Seeker the way. The, the, the thing with the Jeskai Charm attack next turn, if that's what Tomata ends up doing, is even if it doesn't, you know, kill Takamura here, Tomata's going to end up at millions of life. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for those of you at home uh, wondering, uh, this is Magic the Gathering, and the millions of life Luis is referring to is probably figurative. Probably, but we're not sure. We haven't actually uh, ended We haven't actually counted. My, my count is 37 if the ultimate price doesn't get cast, and 32 if it does. Oh, okay. Yeah, so millions was fine. Right. Basically, shorthand, millions is shorthand for like 10 or more. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to gain millions as in 11 life. And I guess Ultimate Price can't get cast at this point, given that the Warden just immediately got buffed. So so what's bad about this attack? Seeker can get double blocked, and you can kill one Siege Rhino. The Knights are just... I guess you can double block with the Warden and the Siege Rhino on the Seeker. You get to kill the Siege Rhino. A Knight gets eaten by a Siege Rhino. But then two Knights, Mantis Rider and the Hangerback, come through and drop Takemura to one. Uh, that sounds pretty good to me. I, I think I think I'm in for. I, I, I'm pretty sure I'm in for minus four getting. Oh, you can also. I guess the fire impulse is gone, so you can't quite do it with Jace. But you can also just plus Jace, and then that just makes the block slightly worse. You, you even lo mm -hmm. don't lose an additional creature. You can also plus one Gideon, but I, I definitely like Emblem yeah. more. Yeah, Emblem it is. So now for the rest of the game, even if it's not the creatures in play, every creature for Tamana. Gets plus one, plus one. And the only, the real decision left is whether you plus one Jason like one of the rhinos or something. He just attacks with the mantis rider. Oh, wow. That makes me think he's going to just got charm like a warden back to the top. Or potentially even a siege runner back to the top and not worry about the life drain too much. No, nope, just another Gideon. <laughs> There's no just about another Gideon. I guess Gideon. he drew another Gideon, so that does <laughs> give him another good option. I, I don't think Tomata can lose this game almost no matter what <laughs> happens here because he's setting up next turn another Gideon emblem plus then finally this Jeskai charm, which I've been wanting to cast every turn for five days. <laughs> <laughs> also, you know, if Tomata draws a land, he can actually Jeskai charm Jace Jeskai charm, which... That, has to be completely lethal at that point. <laughs> so right now, if he uses the Jeskai Charm for plus one and lifelink and makes the emblem, all of those ally tokens are five fives. Yeah, and, you know, a bunch of five five ally tokens, a six six Mantis Rider, a seven seven Hangerback Walker, a six six Seeker of the Way. That, that has to be enough. I, I, th I think Tomato's almost running up the score here. He, <laughs> he, might, he might be just trying to hit 50 life. <laughs> Well, he is going to be dealing millions of damage. Do, do you get a Do you get an extra ball? <laughs> yeah. So in comes the siege rhino, and this is, of course, the setting up my wingmate rock attack. And things go don't go very wrong if if you block with a bunch of three threes. Plus, might as well. You can also just block with a 5-5 five, five Hangerback. The, your concern there is that if Hangerback gets obs on Charmed, then the Siege Runner tramples over. I mean, we know that Takamura's plan is, is slightly less nefarious than that. It's just play a Wingmate Rock. But By the way, he has, he has uh, three Wingmate Rocks at this point. Yeah, I don't think he's going to get a chance to cast all three of them, or actually even two of them. Well, there's one. <laughs> when your opponent starts untapping before you've even finished getting your token into play this is I think this will be the final turn I just hope Tomata draws an, a sixth land so he can <laughs> flash back the Jeskai charm <laughs> and, well, 
what modes would you choose on the flashback? Probably just plus plus one again. Yeah. <laughs> just you know, just go, try go to for the try, maximum amount. try to test if we've got triple digit life capacity on the uh, scoreboard. You shouldn't say things like that. People outside this booth are terrified now. <laughs> no, he can't get to a hundred. Can, can he? Can 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 he give anything? In fact, uh, he he did draw a land, but it's yeah. a Mystic Monastery. Which I, I think it's tomato, tragic. tomato will be fine here. <laughs> I mean, he has six attackers to get through, so it isn't lethal, but it is still just extremely bad. I think Takamura's in literally chump block four times mode. Right, it's 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 the overrun situation where Gosh. even if you don't kill your opponent with the overrun you've cast, they have to put so many creatures in front to not die. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We've got a second emblem. Sending everybody in. And gaining 34 life is what it looks like to me. And, you know, this is the finals of the Pro Tour. Tomata should absolutely not just be like, I've got the Death Guy charm, because he wants to try to, you know, kill Takemura, <laughs> even though there's not a very easy way for him to lose this game no matter what. If, if, if this was like a game in playtesting or you're playing with one of your friends or something, at that point you can just flash them to Death Guy charm and be like, come on. <laughs> but... <laughs> This is the fun of the Pro Tour. This is the correct way to do things. And uh, it is funny, though, that, you know, <laughs> Takamura is going to spend a bunch of time thinking and then just has absolutely no chance of this turning out well. So right now, every creature on the board for, for Tamana has plus two, plus two. Currently. And then when Jeskai Charm resolves, a bunch of them will get plus and plus one on Life Link. Secular will actually get plus two, plus two. And because of the double Prowess life trigger. <laughs> and I think... It's correct for Takamura to assume that Tomata does not have a Jeskai Charm in hand because you just can't possibly beat that card. So I, I like him blocking as if it, that card doesn't exist because you're not, you're not winning anyway. You might as well put yourself in a position to, to win regardless. And right now, le letting three creatures through will drop, uh, Tomata, or will drop Takimura here to one depending on how he blocks. Like, if he lets Hanger back and two knights in, in, he takes 14, goes to one, and I think that's okay. Or, or he chumps the Hanger back, and now he takes 12 and goes to three. So, again, there, there is a Jeskai charm waiting, but <laughs> I think it was good to not play around it. <laughs> <laughs> and there we have it. All right. So, uh, we knew that was going to happen a while ago. Uh, and, oh, show-offs. All right, a million and ten <laughs> life. Yeah, all right. We should take a moment to thank all the, the cameras and all the people behind the scenes uh, who do such an amazing job here at the Pro Tour, um, even when they spill a million life uh, on across the graphic like that. <laughs> uh, well, that's just thorough. accuracy. You know, we're, we strive for full <laughs> clarity and accuracy in reporting. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Gideon. Uh, Gideon really let him build out that board and, and, and take his time. And uh, eventually, I mean, that was, you know, what, half a million of the damage that was dealt <laughs> came from ally tokens. Why don't yep. we take a look at the brand new Gideon here in Battle for Zendikar, the mythic rare planeswalker. He certainly has returned to Zendikar. And uh, for a moment, I thought I said to help the Eldrazi. And then I saw the word defeat. And that makes a lot more sense <laughs> in flavor terms. Uh, Gideon has additional synergies in ally based decks. And the M1 ability was added because he lacked the loyalty for a traditional I, ultimate. I have seen Gideon in a lot of decks. None of them have been ally-themed decks. Uh, so far, we haven't really seen that theme yeah. come out to play. I think there are enough powerful allies, like Lantern Scout, the 3-2 that gives all your creatures lifelink, is the sort of card that I'm interested in, in really trying yeah. to get, get did, the hang of. Did you of. guys try that out at all? Or? It, it was an interesting sideboard card against Red. Imagine if you have a Siege Rhino and you just like play Lantern Scout or tackle Siege Rhino and Warden in Game 7. So... <laughs> I, I would certainly not close the door on ally strategies. I think for right now, uh, Gideon is showing up more as just like a linchpin of the green, white, and Obzon, and some uh, even of the Jeskai decks. And in fact, we even saw it in some Esper control decks. Saw so it in Esper control decks. Saw so it in Sam Black's uh, Bant tokens deck. Uh, so you know, it's 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 real. It's really been, uh, I think, one of the. I mean, obviously, the breakout non-land 
of it's Battle the, for it's Zendikar. The, it's the most powerful card in, in, yeah. in the Battle for Zendikar. Something I'm, I'm really looking forward to is this has been the first Pro Tour under the new uh, rotation system. Uh, so, of course, we're, we're learning what that means. And one of the first things that springs to my mind is that, you know, there, there is only one more set in this you know this this block that's coming up uh, with uh, oath of the gate watch which means that some of these things that we're we've got question marks over we're not that far away potentially from finding some answers where you know maybe gideon and ally based strategies maybe we sit here in this booth in you know uh, early next year and we're talking about ally strategies everywhere in the top eight of a pro tour because it turns out that you know that's part of the the missing pieces um from this the two-act drama that is the, the battle for zendikar block sure i mean cards always change in value come mm. rotation i mean the cards that are most impacted by rotation are not usually the incoming cards so much as the cards that are, are left behind uh, by the rotation, you yeah, know, your your silk wraps, if you so, will. Yeah, exactly. I mean, th that was a card that was essentially printed in Battle for Zendikar when it comes to its constructed impact. Mm -hmm. And discovering those cards is actually a, a, one of the really big skills. Is seeing the cards that may have gotten pushed out by previous sets that are, are now still legal and actually quite good. I, I, I was talking to Sam Black about his his uh, token deck, and you know, Secure the Wastes was a card for him that was like that for him. He's like, you know, people played this card and it was it was fine, but he's like, we were actually playing it in a lot of our. A lot of our different decks, but but the real the real breakout here for that was Silk Wrap. I, I did play Silk or not Silk Wrap, Secure the Waste at, at an earlier Pro Tour this year, so <laughs> it was not the only one. Well, there is the uncommon enchantment uh, from Dragons of Tarkir. We're starting to get very familiar with that artwork. Added in development to help white decks control the battlefield early in the game. Well, uh, yeah, yep, that's kind of what happened. Began at common, but shifted to uncommon. You want to balance the limited environment, make sure people can actually get there. Uh, get their creatures into play and get to do something with them before it gets taken away by too many silk wraps. Yeah, it, it's kind of funny how uh, this card has risen up so much in, in terms of uh, utility, despite the fact that Dramuka's Command is one of the most played cards in the format, and it's all really about Hangerback Walker. Well, that's a big part of it, where, yeah, when you silk wrap a Hangerback and then they draw Dramuka's Command, you, they don't really get anything back. Right. The Hangerback just, just dies. It comes back. It just doesn't stick but around. We, we've also seen silk wrap as protection for bigger enchantments, like in the Jeskai Ascendancy deck that Martin Mueller made top eight with. Their silk wraps are especially good because they protect Jeskai Ascendancy from Dramoka's Command, and that interaction is actually really relevant. Well, why don't we take a look at Hangerback Walker, which is a card that we've seen plenty of in the top eight, but not necessarily to, to best effect. It's felt it's felt like the kind of card that is so powerful that everyone knows it's so powerful, therefore everyone makes sure that it doesn't get to be so powerful when it's actually on screen. It hasn't felt like it's done a ton, at least just anecdotally today on screen. Well... Part of it is that not every deck is running it. Mm -hmm. That we have seen higher percentages of hangerbacks previously, and part of it is yeah, people are good at adapting to this card. You know, even when your hangerback gets silk wrapped or obzon charmed or just guy charmed to the top of your library, you didn't invest that much in it, and it's a quite a powerful card for all mm -hmm. that. Right, for a card that you're just paying two for a lot of the time, people are really, you know, basically shooting it with a bazooka. Right, when you pay two for a hangerback and then they silk wrap it. You didn't actually lose out. Both players played two mana. I mean, that, that, that's kind of the end of the story. It's, it's not, when you pay six for a hanger back and activate it three times, then it gets obs on charmed. Well, that's a little different, but the, for the most part, it's not too bad. The, the deck where this really shined for me this weekend was a, was a deck that was actually able to take advantage of Hangerback Walker fully was that blue-black aristocrat stack that Christian Calcano and Oliver Tomiko and the target guys were playing because... Yeah, you know, with the Nantikos, just able to sacrifice the hanger back walker at will. So, you know, less worried about silk wraps and that kind of stuff. The players have drawn their opening hands and are trying to work out whether they are ready to start game three in this best three out of five. So they're still both two games away uh, from victory. They are going to keep. That's great. Seven cards each. That's what we want. And we're away with Kazuyuki Takamura on the left starting off so you're telling me you like Jeskai Charms, Luis Vargas. <laughs> well, I've got some Jeskai Charms <laughs> for you. I do like Jeskai Charms. I do like it a lot more when you're on the play and have a two-drop, because when you're on the draw and have Jeskai Charms as a three-drop, it's kind of like you're catching up, which eh, is a little less enticing, i got to admit. So you see Wooded Foothills, Wooded Foothills, Windswept Heath, Double Jeskai Charm, Valorous Stance, Disdainful Stroke, and Mantis Rider. So all cheap, all action uh, for Tamada early. Uh, lots of uh, responses to things, just the one creature right now. Uh, Takamura, meanwhile, 
uh, is going to run out for two mana. Here's a Hangerback Walker that we've just seen. Uh, it's got Wingmate Rock, uh, which wasn't sufficient last time, just didn't get a chance to cast them all. Dromacus to Command, and Sorin, Solemn Visitor, the one Planeswalker coming out of the sideboard. Disdainful Stroke was a good draw for Tamana because now he can leave mana up for Disdainful Stroke, and if Takamura doesn't cast anything, you know, worth countering, you can he can then use Jeskai Charm to put like something like let's say Hangerback on top of the library. Hangerback is also a good target for Jeskai Charm because in on turn five or six, you don't really want to draw a Hangerback. So Jeskai right. Charm in that case, like with what you saw with the Tassiger in round one, is a lot less you know, it's more powerful to put it back on top than to just kill it. See the the sword and solemn visitor in uh Takamura's hands. What 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 is the what's the role of Sword and Solemn Visitor in this? Just, it's just the same thing. It's the idea of just working like a Gideon, but you know, just getting creatures out on the board and the lifelink and so yeah, Soren is kind of like a Gideon. Instead of a uh, two-two on the ground, you get a two-two flying, which yeah, fairly relevant. But more importantly, the plus one ability to give all your creatures plus one plus one life link mean you can drop Soren and have just this big turn where you gain ten plus life. You, you, your own Jeskai Charm, if you will, it's actually very similar to Jeskai. Yeah, Charm. that's that's. I was wondering if he was just jealous of the high score. <laughs> right. <laughs> We've got a new contender here, and and what that lets you do is kind of end up in a situation where you're winning a race. So it looks like, did Tomata draw a two drop? He drew a secret of the way. That, I think that was very strong for him. Just getting to play a two drop and then have all, a bunch of answers in your hand makes it a lot more likely that he's going to be able to be proactive here. Yeah, I mean, he can go two into three and then into counter, kill, bounce and boost, bounce and boost. I like that game, counter, kill, or boost. Well, Having having Seeker in play when you're casting these Jeskai Charms means that you're draining them for three. You're hitting them for three and gaining three a turn just off the Seeker itself, no matter what mode you chose on mm. Jeskai Charm. And and that's very appealing because that means you're making forward progress. You, you know, the thing I said when we started the game was I don't like Jeskai Charm when you don't have a two-drop. Like, imagine casting, you know, I kind of like just casting Jeskai Charm he here dep depending on how Takimura taps his mana and just getting in for three, but... Takamura has a Dromoka's command, it looks like, so he could he could just cash in his hangar back right now. Plus one, plus one counter, making it a 2-2. Two -two, fight, end up with two flyers. That's certainly the safest. He could wait and see if Tamada tries to cast a spell and then do it in response, which that, that could also mess up Tamada's plan significantly. Alternately, Takamura could just activate the hangar back now, make it a 2-2, two -two and just pass the turn. But I think he really wants to use Dromoka's command because his hand is full of spells. He doesn't have another land. And if he draws a land, or even if he doesn't with that Anafenza, he's just got all spells. Right, he, he'd like to play Anafenza next turn. Yeah, it's really important that he uses his mana this turn. So how he uses this command is, is really key. And, you know, we've seen all weekend Dramoka's command, Kologon's command, Ojutai's command, Atarka's command, you know, sorry, Salomgar, uh, <laughs> uh. being used to good effect, but they're very tricky. They've got four modes, choose two, and, and figuring out when to use them optimally is really one of the skills that have gotten these players, you know, t you know to the top eight here. If I had to lean one direction, I think the safest play is to just attack with hanger back, whether he blocks or not, just, you know, Dramoka's command and fight it. But the highest reward play is to wait and try to do something in response. Well, he has gone for the highest reward play. Wait and do something in response. Now, the, the risk here is he opens himself up to, if he activates his, oh, but it's a Mystic Monastery is the land. So Tamada is taking uh, a, a, also a more conservative route. He's, you know, he's actually really hoping, and he doesn't know this, that Takamura draws a fourth land this turn because he left up Disdainful Stroke and Valor Stance. So, you know, the Valor Stance actually covers his base. So either way, Tamada's going to be pretty happy here. is going to tap out for Anafenza, and it's going to get uh, Valor Stance end of turn. If it was a fourth land, he could have also cast a Siege Rhino, which would have gotten Disdainful Stroked. And then you get to Jeskai Charm. You see the missing land drop. Then you get to Jeskai Charm, the hangar back, and attack for three. That sounds pretty appealing. But I always want to cast these Jeskai Charms, and Tamada has shown an unwillingness to do so. Right. There's, an, there's, a, there's a chance he just decides to Mantis Rider instead. But one of the reasons I like casting Jeskai Charm in, in the spot next turn is that it protects you from Dromoka's command. Because my prediction for this turn is attack for two with hangar back and then an offensive. Though it looks like 
Takimura is is going to play around Valor Stance. He, again, there are four copies of Valor Stance in Tomata's deck. So by by leaving Hanger back up, he's leaving up Tomoka's command, and he's playing a lot more conservatively. In fact, both of these players are doing so, which leads to a very interesting interplay. It, you know, these these players are not just jamming their cards. It, there are a lot of players would, and given that. You see a lot of players spend turns where they don't use their mana, but that kind of trades with the other players' turn who didn't use their mana. So it's it's, it's all very interesting. Yeah, there, there was a situation where uh, Takamura had the three mana. You know, one one was tapped, and if he had activated Hangerback Walker at the end of uh, uh, Tomata's turn, he could have, you know, if he had drawn his third lane, could have Jeske charmed it back on top there and then not had access to his Jermoka's command. So... You, you see these guys really dancing around each other's. What what could they have? Right, and you know, as long as both players keep playing around their their cards, we're gonna go, we're actually gonna see Takimura get punished more because he missed a land drop. He can't keep man up forever. Whereas Tamada, I think, is pretty happy playing the land go game. It looks like Tamada might actually just play a Gideon because there's there's very there's very little that. That Takamura can do to punish him, maybe. I mean, if he's fetching main phase, that that seems to indicate that. Also, he doesn't. Let's see. Tamada does not have a fiery impulse in hand, so yeah, he's just gonna tap out for a Gideon, make a knight, and then you don't want to attack into the hangar back because it becomes a three-three and trades for a seeker, and that that leaves you in a bad position. So Takamura could really do with some land in the reasonably near future because we we'll look at his hand and he has got plenty. Uh, going on there, and sure, he can put a counter now, but there you see Siege Rhino at four, Soren, Velizid Soren Solemn Visitor at four, Double Wingmate Rock at five. As we see uh, the so, Dromica's command. Kind of well, interesting. I'm, I'm wondering... Tomata needs to gain three life there. Because, though, actually, he doesn't need to. It's uh, Yeah, okay. It, it is actually technically a trigger he could have missed, but it looks like they, they, they resolved it cause for the lifelink on Seeker because the two creatures just fought. Mm. I think it would have been very reasonable there for Takamura to use the play Paul Dean made earlier and let his hanger back die instead of giving it an that's additional what, That's counter. what I was wondering, especially with the Solemn Sorum visit, Solemn, Sorum, Solemn Visitor in his hand where he could push all of his token, you know, the three uh, tokens in for as two ones with lifelink on that turn and take down Gideon. There, there is a pretty big reward for that, and uh, I, I, hitting getting down to one, I think, works out pretty well. So, though, you know, the fact that Takamura drew a fourth land is really good for him. If he, if his play was on Offenza, no fourth land, it would have been much, much worse. Though, you know, uh, Tamata has some good options here. He, he can cast like Valor Stance on the Siege Rhino, Just Guy Charm, the Hanger back back on top, and actually, if he wants, plus one the Gideon, just come over for five. Tamada still with very powerful cards in hand. Takamura with land number four. That takes care of Siege Rhino being able to come out, and he's now just one land away rather than... And there's the, the stance. Yeah, okay, so that's gone. <laughs> and there's Jeskai Charm. Let's make sure you don't get to five. Well, so does, doesn't uh, choose to rumble, though. Yeah, Tamada's interested in just making more knights here, and... The hanger back draw, not only is it not the most impressive draw just by itself, it also, again, prevents Takamura from drawing a land here and makes it that much less likely that he can cast a wingmate rock. He also needs to draw an untapped white source to, <laughs> to, to cast rock, which the battle lands aren't untapped right now. There's only one basic forest in play, so he's really leaning on, like, windswept heath or planes is basically it. And, and how many of those? There's four heaths left and one planes? Four heaths, two planes. Two planes, okay. So that's about it. So... Tomato really has to, you know, think that he's 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 in good shape here because he can now just do the same play again. He can just guy charm the hanger back to the top again. If he had drawn a six land, it would have been really good because then he could also play a mantis rider. But just guy charming here is just time walk is awesome. Casting, you know, a card that essentially lets you take an extra turn when you have a planeswalker in play gives you a huge edge. And the disdainful stroke in hand means if that same play happens again, then you can disdainful stroke it. Oh, and there it is. Four mana wow. for a 2-2 two -two hanger back walker, but it gets countered with Disdainful Stroke. And he's got another Disdainful Stroke in hand. Here's Mantis Rider. Yeah, it yeah. looks like a second Disdainful Stroke in hand, and now it might be time to plus one Gideon. <laughs> it is smash. <coughs> Cute. That's just 12 points directly. Yep, that's Takamura at nine. <laughs> 
So far, Wingmate Rock has ha had a just, companion at all points. Just sat there. That's game. Wow. Doesn't even need the other disdainful Ryoichi stroke. Ryoichi Tamada takes the lead. And with his 61 career pro points, well, he is heading towards another 30 here. Because he is one game away from being a pro tour champion. Jeskai one away. Luis, I wanted to ask you. I wanted to ask you um, as we head for this next game. Um, there are some aspects of Magic. You've been a, a, a great uh, ambassador for the production of Magic content across lots of different media, uh, and it's been very clear. One of the lessons from this weekend is that mana bases are super important and the sequencing of them. Now, it is very easy for a normal player to simply get a deck list and therefore have the correct lands because. That's been worked out for us by you and your testing teams, and we can go to the website. That's fine. But is sequencing something that is easy to teach? Can we expect in the next two to three weeks that all the main strategy websites are going to be full of people like you and Jerry Thompson and Brad Nelson and Patrick Chapin teaching the world how to sequence lands? Because, honestly, this feels like a skill that is, A, not well-known, B, not often utilized, and C, not easy to teach. I, I think all of those things are true. Uh, actually, one of the best people to, to, to turn to in this kind, for this kind of thing is Frank Karsten. Mm. You know, he, he always likes running the numbers, and he actually wrote an entire article about how to sequence you know, your, your fetch lands into your battle lands, into your basic lands, or all, you know, which combinations, and drew up a bunch of sample hands. Uh, and that sort of thing is exactly what you're looking for, I think. Practice, there's no substitute for that, but reading about what exactly you're looking for and then practicing is actually the perfect way to accomplish that. Okay, well, I'll make sure that you don't have to say. I, I presume that this is at channel 5 it, it is, yeah. Okay, because, you know, <laughs> um, you know, that was not a setup in any way. I genuinely <laughs> wanted that information for me. Um, because I read it before you know. the Pro Tour. We, we used <laughs> okay. it when we were building decks. <laughs> All right, well, so you have proof that it, that it works. That, and that's um, funny because Frank Carson, not on Team Channel Fireball. <laughs> he has been in the past, but he, yes. he writes for the Channel Fireball website. Sure. Um, all right, so uh, there are places that you can already get some of that information, but it, it does feel to me like there's a real learning curve ahead for a lot of us um, regular players um, coming out of this Pro Tour because that, that sequencing is just, to me, BDM, doesn't feel natural. Sure, well, we saw, we saw the thing with, with uh, you know, uh, Cinderglade in, in one of these decks, even though we, you, it doesn't have any need for red. You know, because that becomes an untapped green source. Right. W you know, if you look at Tomata's Jeskai deck, that's again straight Jeskai. It does have a Cinder Glade in it. And I'm sorry, it doesn't have a need for green. That's, right. That's and it. a yeah. Canopy Vista. Yeah. And it's that makes Windswept Heath and Wooded Foothills get off-color mana sources because Wooded Foothills can get a mountain or it can get a forest, which yeah. the forest lets it get Canopy Glade, which or Canopy Vista, which then lets it tap for white mana. So it. What, what is worth noting, though, is Wooded Foothills can't get the enemy color. So red-green can't get blue. There's no combination that touches blue yet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're assuming at some point in the future it will. So right now, Kazuyuki Takamura has to win the next two. Ryuji Tamada with his Gideon sleeves there. Well, he just needs one of the next two. The, the sleeves we got for this Pro Tour are awesome, by the way. Like, Aren't you know, they gorgeous? The, the, the three Pro Tour sleeves, you know, they're always a, a nice little bonus, but they're not always this cool, like Ulamogs and, and, and Gideons and Kioras and whatnot. Are, I, I think they're very well done. I also love the, the nice white frame when you see yeah, the cards it, on the table. It's it's different, you know. It's it's not always the same, and, and I think having that, that variation is good. So, Tamada giving notice to the rest of the world that Team Japan are going to be the real deal when it comes to the World Magic Cup. But yeah, whether or not he wins the Pro Tour, that is the case. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> right. But but come on, Americans. You've still got to feel you've got the best team in the world going into the, the WMC. Well, I think Tom Martell's going to think any team he's on is the best team, but I actually don't know if he's, he's wrong this time. Having Sigrist and Tom Martell and Neil Oliver and, and a fourth who, who won a WMCQ, which is also right. quite good. Well done, Joe Sadowski. Yeah, I, I I raise your player of the year <laughs> with two-time player of the year Yu Yu Watanabe and player of the year Kenji Samura. Yeah, I'm not saying Japan yeah. has, has anything less than a stellar <laughs> team. And maybe Pro Tour champion. And possibly right? Pro Tour champion yep. uh, Tamada. There'll be plenty of you know, 
it would. I did find it very entertaining because I don't. I think Magic players, especially when they are this good, are by and large a pretty humble bunch. I don't think generally they are particularly boastful. And it it came as a bit of a surprise to me that when you interview, interviewed all those national champions uh, on the eve of the Pro Tour and said, "Make the case for your country making the top eight. and they were like, "The top eight? How dare you? We're, <laughs> go we're going to win. We're going to be in the final." Of course we are. And, uh, yeah, we're going to have great fun uh, with the 72 countries that make up the World Magic Cup. Uh, just a tremendous yeah, few It's days. coming up pretty fast. Yeah, it's like uh, first week December uh, sounds about right. Um, second week December, we're going to be uh, down in Barcelona. Yeah, I've gotten to play in it once, and i gotten to cover it once, and both times I had a, had a great time. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a magnificent Bonfires thing. Bonfires aside. <laughs> uh, yes. Mm. You'll always have that gift, though. Yeah, that, you know, I, I played my part in creating what I think is is, is legitimately one of the better moments in absolutely in captured on Magic film history. <laughs> All right, so let's get to it because the hand you're looking at there belongs to Ryochi Tamada. Um, I think it's about to go away very, very soon. Uh, it is. Uh, yeah. So he oh, it looks like he's scrying actually. Oh, really? Does he have no land? I must. I'm surely I. <laughs> he had no land. He what was that about? He, he, you could see that that, that 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 grin on his face. He knows what he did. <laughs> Everyone knows what he did. Yeah. He knows this he is televised, right? He, he didn't play a land on turn one. <laughs> Are we trying to have five games? <laughs> well, well there, he got a land. He drew a windswept teeth. It's not. It's not over yet. Actually so, speechless. So we've speculated on keeping the no lander with the scry on the draw. I haven't seen anyone do it on six though. It's a, it's a more of a on five sort of thing. I, I, I just did, don't know what to did, say to that. Did Takamura also mulligan? Uh, I can't tell based on the cards he has, but he he's in fine shape here. Okay. <laughs> Mulligan or not, he's going to be able to play a Siege Rhino next turn followed up by an Obs on Charm and a Den Protector. <laughs> like, does Tamada, is Tamada sitting there going, I'm 2-1 up, and if this works out, I win the Pro Tour? I guess so. Uh, he might be thinking, if I just hit two lands, this hand is fine, but two land with a Scry, I mean, that... I, I wow. wonder if this is this is a maneuver he pulled during the Swiss, because <laughs> that, that, that would be pretty funny. It was actually pretty funny, because on day one, Paul Chion, one of my teammates, played uh, Tamada... And he's like, yeah, I played against uh, you know this a Japanese guy who I don't recognize, but he played really well. Like he specifically said that he's like, yeah, he had, and he had four Valorant stances in the main deck. Who does that these days? Because because <laughs> Paul was playing green white and and you know he just got Valor stanced a bunch of times, and he's like, and he had four Jeskai charms, and it's just like, wow. <laughs> but it turns out that was our potential Pro Tour champion. We'll we'll, we'll see in game five because I, I don't think that, <laughs> I don't think that we're deciding things uh, here. Well. Uh, I've just got sideboarding notes. It sounds like Tamada has taken all the land out of his deck for game four. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you to Rashad Miller down there on the floor for that. He hasn't. He has that, not. No. That, that's, that's not some super tech, by the way. Oops. But the okay. hangerback walkers uh, are going to uh, deliver what... Confirmation of double sleeve <laughs> <laughs> yes. verified here. It's just ridiculously far ahead. We're spending more time searching for <laughs> this extra sleeve than we are playing, <laughs> playing the rest four. of this game, I think. As any magic player knows, when a sleeve betrays you, it must be destroyed. <laughs> I was just say, that's, we've, we've seen that on both sides of the table. They just well, the, the actual reason is so you don't accidentally receive a card right. in like a damaged sleeve because it looks normal. But the, the the real reason is you know you want to punish it for for, so, for its weakness. So this and and, and it's an example to the others. Yeah, exactly. Well, we're in Eldrazi land, so presumably the sleeve is it that betrays. <laughs> yes. So, Tamada basically needs. Takimura to be on no spells, and that Siege Rhino is <laughs> Ever kind of again. direct evidence to the contrary. There. <laughs> yes. Okay. I, I don't know that I've ever yeah. seen. He's like, I drew a land, but it's still not great. Stream. 
you know, even though I'm pretty much against conceding early in the in the, the finals of a pro tour, I think, <laughs> I think this doesn't count as early. I, I believe we okay. can move on. Yeah. I look, we've been singing his praises all day. We've been saying he's clearly terrific and he clearly is. There has to be a moment there where he explained it to himself in such a way that he made a convincing case. Look, I'm not going to say why, but I, I do have a soft spot in my heart for players who play pretty well and are pretty greedy. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm just saying I think those players should get a decent amount of respect. And All right. You know, maybe Tomata had an ambitious keep there, but, you know, he's in game five of the Pro Tour finals. So, yeah. well, Plus, he's on the play. And, you know, given that he's got a deck full of Jeskai charms, uh, which I do like that card, by the way. I don't know if I mentioned. <laughs> I, I think being on the play is, is pretty huge when, when that's the card you're running with. All right. So, game five. Here we go. This time, you can't afford that to happen. So, do people get greedy? Do people get super cautious? Let's just hope we get s seven cards apiece, decent hands, and a decent... Me medium cautious would be fine here. Yes. Well, you know, and, and this is something we, we kind of talk about every Pro Tour Finals, and it's a good thing to talk about, it. you know, the fact that... But you shouldn't play the Pro Tour Finals game one, two, three, four, or five really any differently than, you know... Game three of of round two. Sure, you should be be making the making the I plays. I think you should probably you be medium cautious there too. <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> you should be making the plays that give you the best chance to win, whether it's game five or, or game one or you know, again, you know, you're three three. It, it right. doesn't matter. And in this particular case, I think, you know, these players have shown enough composure that my my guess is they're just going to make the best plays they can, and hopefully that'll be good enough. Well, we had some tremendous players here in the top eight. We had Ricky Chin in his first ever top eight. He went down to Tomorrow. First ever pro tour. Yeah. Yep. First you know. <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> An unbelievable story that is undoubtedly going to inspire a whole wave of people from his local store to be checking the PT, you know, the pre TQ schedule. You're like wow, you know, I this is a guy I've played at my store. I've I've lost to him, I've beaten him, I've you know, I'm gonna go. I want to go play on the Pro Tour, too. A uh, great story. Yeah, so a terrific job by him at reaching the top eight. Then you had Paloi de Dama de Rosa against John Finkel. It was Finkel that emerged from that in a fairly routine victory, uh, to be fair. But Tomata took care of him uh, in the semifinals. Uh, so that was sort of one half of the bracket. Then we had Martin Muller, the great Dane, num uh, 18-year-old now. Uh, playing in the World Magic Cup and the last year's World Magic Cup winning captain. Uh, he was up uh, against Takamura, so of course Takamura uh, won that quarterfinal. And then we had Paul Dean um, in what was the, I guess, the upset of the quarterfinals, uh, defeating Owen Turtenwald uh, by 2-0. to zero. So that set up a semifinal against Takamura. And of course the Japanese player advanced again, which is why these two have been going at it hammer and tongs for your entertainment. So... Let's see who claims the $40,000 first prize and who has to settle for $20,000 for second place here. Also, the winner will become a Platinum Pro, joining the elite of the game for the rest of this season and all of next. So that's the best part of two years Platinum status on this one game of Magic. If that doesn't make the heart pound just a little, if you're imagining yourself in those shoes, really should. The difference between first and second in this tournament is, you know, every year the difference between first and second in the Pro Tour gets bigger and bigger. <laughs> There's just, getting first just comes with so many benefits besides just the actual prize money. And that just makes this game undoubtedly the biggest game of Magic either of these players is ever going to, you know, has ever played before and potentially ever going to play. Yeah, it's very, it's very hard for them get above this to have more at stake and you you're t you guys are both talking about just the direct benefits like the the tangible benefits of of being a platinum pro and but i mean also you know it it, it is sort of life-changing and sort of in terms of becoming a magic celebrity yeah uh, when you look at people's lifetime stats pro tour top eights and number of wins are just like the two most important numbers yeah, I you know I, I imagine if he is not already writing for Japanese websites exactly and, 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 and streaming on Nico Nico and, and doing the, you know suddenly there's going to be a lot more demands on the winner of this match's time and uh, you know he's going to be asked to sign cards you know a whether it's a Siege Rhino or a Mantis Rider for the rest of their life when they play Magic.
So here we go. Moments away from opening hand time. 14 cards, please. Yes, absolutely. 14 cards, please. And let's just divide them evenly, just to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> Dramoka's Command, Anafenza, Warden of the First Tree, Siege Rhino. Tomatoes have started well, but did it not end up with enough lands? Uh, this is two land for Takamura. He's really digging into thinking about this one. Already I knows that Tomato is at six. I mean, a two land hand. If you don't draw the third, it's not. It's not good. But and presumably he's tempted by the fact he has a turn one play. I mean, he has yeah. a warden straight up. Well. Unfortunately for him, the, the opening hand he has doesn't allow him to play the Warden on turn ah, one because okay. Flooded Strand can't get an untapped canopy booster. I <sighs> see, and there we yeah. are. <laughs> Frank <laughs> Carsten sequencing. Yeah. I I don't think you can mulligan that hand. I mean, I, I think you can mulligan that hand. I, I, I would not advise it. Just a two-land hand on the draw with a one-drop and a two-drop is... I, I think it's got to be good enough. Like, sometimes you don't draw the third land, sometimes you lose, and you hope that's not in game five of the Pro Tour, but I think your win percentage overall will go down if you mulligan two lands. But it's the entirely way. conceivable that he has Anafenza in play on turn three. He's digging for cards with Obzon Charm on turn four. Yeah, he can and, easily and get off out to the of races. It. Especially yeah. since the Obzon Charm and the Anafenza mean that drawing one land is just going to be good enough. Does it change the choice knowing that your opponent's already at six? Do you get a little greedier? It actually can change your mulligan decisions when your opponent's mulligan, but it shouldn't change it by much, and in this case, I don't think it's enough to push the needle one way or the other. Okay, Tamada, let's have... That's two land. Three land, three spells. He is three times as likely to keep it as his last hand. Yeah, there's uh, Gideon Ally of Zendikar, Wingmate Rock. Fiery Impulse and Fiery Impulse and that, three. That, that, is that a fine seems hand. fine. And Scry goes to the bottom. Here we go, then. You get a look at Takamura's hand there. The Warden, the Anafenza, the Dramokus Command, the Abzon Charm, and two Flooded it Strands. It looks like he has eight cards in hand. Well, he just drew a card first turn. He drew a Duress, it looks like. Yeah, and that actually leads to an interesting decision right. because you can sacrifice yeah. this Flooded Strand for a Sunken Hollow yeah. or a Canopy Vista. <laughs> and that, and whether you want to cast Warden turn two or Duress turn two, that's your option. I, I guess I would lean towards the Duress just because uh, Tamada didn't play a creature on turn two. The only problem with that is you really want to attack with a warden next turn. So this is a, this is one of the pivotal decisions of the game. Do you get Canopy Vista or do you get Sunken Hollow? Is it going to be all about the land here and, in and the battle? And Tamada has Zendikar. put himself in a position to make a turn three Mantis Rider. Yeah, he drew a Mantis Rider, which was just the best card in his deck to draw there. I mean, he mm -hmm. maybe drawing a Jace on turn two would have been slightly more preferable, but he couldn't even cast it on turn two given the, the, the lands he has. So Mantis Rider is, you know, that's one of his ways to win this game quite quickly. So Takamura, who couldn't make the turn one Warden. It has to decide now between yeah. Warden and Duress. <laughs> what is it going to be? I, I, I have to lean towards Duress, but I don't know. It's close. I the, think it's going to... It he's, looks like it's Warden. warden he's getting yeah. the Canopy Vista. I, I think it's very close either way. My, my only reason to lean towards Duress is that Fiery Impulse is a card that would have we couldn't have been played early, and Just Guy Charm is another card that you really don't want to see. Of course, if Takimura just draws the correct fetch land or just a swamp, he gets to you know get the best of both worlds. Just gets to cast Duress, then cast Warden. We draw Silk Rop, though. That that was actually a, a pretty good draw because the, he's going to be facing down a Mantis Rider here. Mm -hmm. Though I think his Warden might be Fiery Impulse on the way. And here we can see like mountain plains and then the prairie stream in hand comes to play on tap to cast the the mantis rider and you know kind of all is well in terms of mana for for tomato at least until next turn because he does he does need to draw a fourth land for gideon followed by a wingmate rock like we could see a quick game tomato could just go mantis rider into gideon into wingmate rock right, and, then, and that could just be it right Yep, there goes Fiery Impulse. He's so. not going to break the uh, Windswept Teeth at the end of the turn. He wants to, I guess, maximize his opportunity to draw. Yeah, he wants to leave as many... Because because he's getting a Plains to make it come to, to the Prairie Stream to come in untapped, he just wants to maximize his draw step. He would rather draw the Plains that he would have fetched on his draw step and then be able sure. to get another Plains instead. Mantis Rider on the way. And then hopefully, Gideon. 
And then hopefully, Wingmate Rock. So if Takemura misses on land, he's going to get a Sunken Hollow end of turn. If he misses on land, he's still going to get to Silk Wrap the Manslaughter, or just cast Duress, which is a, a valid way to stop Gideon. But in for three. It's really important for Takemura that he draws a land this turn. And uh, looking at the sideboard, it looks like the big difference in the sideboarding is those duresses for game three. It looks like it's the only uh, only real difference. Takamura looking through his past sideboards, he has not brought in the duresses. And, you know, duress is going to be quite good here, especially if Takamura can draw a third land. Well, he drew a land. It comes into play tapped, but it's still it's still going to serve its purpose. So away goes Mantis Rider. And drawing that Mystic Monastery last turn instead of an untapped land means that Takimura, oh, he, he's, he's now cooking with gas. He now gets to duress Gideon and play an Anafenza. Wow. And that, that's huge. Well, there's two Gideons, so I guess duressing Gideon was not as devastating <laughs> as it could have been. No. Back up Planeswalker. <clears throat> But now, one, two, three, four, on a So we're going to get a game out of this. This could have been a landslide. Instead, we're gonna, I think we're going to get a, a pretty good game. That's a fifth land there. And it would have just been, I think it would have been hugely in Tomato's favor had he drawn that Wood of Foothills just a turn earlier. But instead, he's going to have to wait a turn on getting that Wingmate Rock active. So Gideon, 2-2 two, two Knight, Wooded Foothills, go. Wingmate Rock's still going to be good this game. And because... Could you see him just sacking the Gideon so that the Wingmate Rocks are 4-5? It depends if that Soldier Token lives to attack. It's possible that it, it doesn't because of uh, Dromoka's Command. Actually, Gideon's not even going to live. Dromoka's Command is actually going to take it out. Wow. So that that was huge. That, that, actually, right. that sequence was actually awesome. So. And C. Drino is... In the wings, yeah, for Takamura. Takamura now, now is just firmly ahead in this game. Wingmate Rock just not not a great card when you're behind. It's just a five mana three four flyer, and when it doesn't come with its pair, then you know it's significantly less good. So, Tomato really just has to draw something to get him back into this. Yep, there you see it. The most important word on that card right now is raid. There's no creatures to attack first. That is both the card graphic and the graphic of Tomata's hand before his draw. Wow. Ryochi Tomata was 2-1 up, but Kazuyuki Takamura kept on battling, made it back to 2-2, two -two, and now looks to be there, ahead here in game five. There might be some confusion over what fought last turn. The Anafenza fought the knight, and the, and the Hangerback got the token. The Hangerback didn't die because he didn't fight. Ah, okay. I think Tomata's forced to playing Wingmate Rock here just mm -hmm. because he can't afford to wait multiple turns for an attacker. But I think Takimura is quite happy with how this is all turning out. Draws a windswept Heath. Sea Rhino, Amzan Charm to work with. Smash. <laughs> Counter on the hanger back. And now the wingmate could block the hanger back. Obzon Charm will make the hanger back either a 4-4 four, four or a 5-5. Five, five. Or, you know, Takamura could let the hanger back die and get three tokens out of the deal. So the block does happen. Here's the charm. Maybe one on Anafenza here. <laughs> And Tomata's going to need a lot of top decks from this position. Tomata untaps. Well, oh, Valor Stance is a start. Mm -hmm. But it's then you realize just how far behind he is because you imagine that Valor Stance already played. And then well, go, imagine if he goes Valor yeah. Stance and then Jeskai Charm next turn. Uh-huh. Valor stands the Anafenza, get hit down to th to eat from the hangar back, get 
drained from Rhino down to, to five. five. Oh, yeah. Face, Hang him back a, and siege. Yeah. And a shambling vent hiding in the lands. So I don't actually yeah, know if Tomata can done. get back into this game. Wow. Kazuyuki Takamura has navigated his way through a stellar field. How many cards are in his graveyard? Is there like his treasure cruise his only way out? He can't have many cards in his graveyard, given yeah. that Anafenzo was in play when the Wingmate Rock happened. So he's got a couple cards at most. He's got a couple fetch lands, right? Yeah. So treasure cruise into like multiple game affecting spells. Two five at his first pro tour. Seven seven. Eleven five. Eleven five. It's definitely the right direction. And here he is, about we think to win. Pro Tour Battle for Zendikar. Siege Rhino. Now what? Handshake time, surely. Have a look. Check. Takamura keeps looking up. That's it. And Kazuyuki Takamura of Japan is your Pro Tour Battle for Zendikar champion, winning the decisive Game 5. Wow. Great stuff. <laughs> and then you see him hold up the, the <laughs> signature card of his victory, Siege Rhino. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Siege Rhino has, has not been a bad card ever since no. it was printed. No, no one is claiming that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think kind of interesting coming into this tournament, Siege Rhino is definitely, uh, you know, you and I did a piece where we talked about the pillars of the format. Uh, Abzan was not really thought to be one of those pillars. It was obviously something that was out there. Everyone was certainly aware that it was a deck, but it, it wasn't It wasn't like public enemy number one like it had been at every event after Pro Tour uh, Cons of Tarkir. Right. We expected more Jeskai, more Atarka Red, more even Green-White Megamorph, and, you know, Obzon. There was a lot of top. all of those, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so Ryoichi Tamada, we will see him again. We will see him in action at the World Magic Cup. He's been tremendous, absolutely tremendous. But he does come up one game short. And Kazuyuki Takemura with Abzan is your champion. Outstanding gentlemen, a pleasure and honor as always. Um, let us head you back to the news desk for more reaction to the news that Kazuyuki Takemura is the champion of Pro Tour Battle for Zendikar. Thank you, Rich. Welcome back to the news desk. We have our champion gentleman, Kazuyuki Takamura from Japan, is our Bro Tour Battle for Zendikar champion. Congratulations to him. Also to Tomata, congratulations on a strong second place finish. And as we mentioned earlier, we're going to be seeing more of Tomata at the World Magic Cup with that Japanese team looking really scary. Oh, yeah. Now, let's take a look. For those of you just joining us, we wanted to bring you through the bracket to show you how the top eight went. I know maybe some of you, you know, had some plans for the day and got a chance to see earlier what was going on in the bracket. Let's bring that up now, and we'll kind of walk you through how the top eight ended up playing out. So, as you can see, we had a really stacked top eight with a lot of big names that you're going to recognize that will just jump off of the page to you. But let's start showing how the semifinals actually went here. We see Tamada, who... Spoiler alert, he makes it to the finals. I uh, got to the semifinals <laughs> over Ricky Chin. Ricky, of course, was in his first Pro Tour ever, and he found himself in the top eight still. A fantastic finish for him. Congratulations to Ricky Th Chin. That whole match was insane. That it was a great morning, match. Just a spectacular match of magic. Well worth going back and watching. I agree, yeah. Ian and I were in the mm -hmm. booth for that one, and it was a real pleasure to commentate that. Next up on the list, we had an absolute blockbuster here. Blockbuster like matchup. The matchup was. <laughs> the magic uh, left a little bit to be desired. Yeah. There we go. John Finkel ultimately defeated Paulo Vitor Dama de Rosa. I didn't want to spoil it. I wanted to wait for the little <laughs> little thing to go. But as you as you alluded to, Randy, you know, it's like one of those things where when you're in the booth, you don't get that many opportunities to commentate on 25 Pro Tour top eights in one you, you match. You mean there's been one ever, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, that kind of level. Um, but unfortunately... Uh, the match itself was was pretty lopsided in terms of It was of, at least uh, good news magic. for uh, Gamers Helping Gamers, the charity that John Great Finkel point. set up to help reward scholarship, you know, award scholarships to uh, different gamers. He gives 50% of his prize money to that scholarship. So that was another couple thousand dollars for them as well. Yeah, fantastic stuff. I think that's so cool. I've actually donated to them myself, in fact. Mm -hmm. I think that's just a great cause uh, to help young people uh, get into school. All right, let's take a look at the top hot half of our bracket as it played out. Well, our champion, Kazuyuki Takimura, defeated 
the young gun, Martin Miller. We, we've seen him, and, uh, you know, he's just a real deal, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, Mark Martin... Uh, you know, he's had some success. We saw him at the World Championship. Yeah, and, and I think that the pro points that he got this weekend is now enough for him to string together the rest of the season worth of invites and into next season. So that, you know, near miss last year, we was one point short of gold. The pro points from this this weekend actually already kind of make up for that. Okay, yeah, that's great. And, and yeah. really early in the season, too, so a really good chance to get to see a lot of Martin. And also... Ta Takamura, by the way, in that game, his mulligan decisions were insanely good. He mulliganed a hand that, you know, was just a little slow and he didn't want to give Muller time to sort of build his whole Jeskai Ascendancy com token combo. Uh, just a brilliant mulligan decision that totally worked out. Takamura won both of those games in that match on six cards. Wow. Yeah. Impressive stuff from Takamura the whole day here. And then on the top, that left one more matchup. Owen Turtenwald versus Paul Dean. Kind of an interesting storyline there, <laughs> too, uh, Ian. We saw that yesterday mm -hmm. as it played out leading up to the top eight. So this is before we had actually had our cut in the final round of Swiss. That's right. So final round of Swiss, both Owen and Paul can draw and lock for the top eight. One wrinkle in this plan, Reed Duke, uh, my brother Owen's teammate, is also playing for... Uh, Top top seeded X and four, top tiebreakers X and four, which would mean he's on the cusp for maybe making top eight. So Owen decides to to run the block for his teammate by actually playing out the match against Paul, um, beats him, and then Reed ends up losing, and Paul instead is the one that squeaks through on X four. Um, so very good for him. Yeah. I, I'm glad that worked out that way. You know, it's always. A tough situation when you're trying to do the right thing for your teammate, but in the process, maybe you're dream crushing someone. But anyway, that all worked out very well. Paul makes it to the top eight. They get a rematch um, against Owen, and, and he wins there. And he wins there, putting himself in the semifinals. So that set us up, of course, for our finals. We can uh, just sort of skip through here. As we saw just now, it was, it was Tamada versus Takimura here, and we have our champion, Kazuyuki Takimura, defeats Ryuichi Tamada and becomes our Pro Tour champion here. Uh, fantastic stuff, of course, all weekend. Um, any, any, any thoughts on the decks? By the way, just to, to loop you in here, right now we're setting up for an award ceremony where we're going to actually get a chance to see Trophy go into hand there for our champion, Takamura. But um, anything from the, from the decks that stood out to you? Well, I mean, not so much from the decks, but I did think both players played just tremendously. Kind of interesting that they were both on three color versions of the decks, none of this fancy splash in the fourth color. Um, but I wanted to, to tell people, if you didn't read the player profiles, uh, Kazuyuki Takimura is actually getting married before oh. the end of the year. Yeah, and he says in his player profile, you know, I told my, you know, my, my soon-to-be wife that I was going to make top eight someday. I want <laughs> to win this one for her. So as a wedding gift to his soon-to-be wife, Wow. He wanted to win a Pro Tour for her. What a great story. And he did That's it. That's awesome. Pretty uh, cool. She must be pretty happy. Uh, I'm sure she was so. watching on the Nico Nico stream at home from Japan. Oh, and, for uh, sure. <laughs> cheering him on. Wow, that is fantastic. So a good story to start off there. Hopefully very long marriage. And uh, <laughs> Kazuyuki Takimura, our champion. And uh, it's going to be a husband soon, too. That's fantastic stuff. Um, again, they're getting set for us over there uh, in the award ceremony. But I did, I did want to ask you guys what, what popped out to your head. Maybe, Ian, if you had anything uh, that stood out to you from the decks here, as we saw kind of an expand in colors from the traditional decks that we had seen in previous standard. But it looks like the traditional colors actually got it done here. Yeah, the big talk of the weekend was the fetch land, battle land mana bases that let you kind of go wild and kind of splash extra colors in your you know three color plus X plus Y kind of decks. Um, in the end, we saw two very traditional kind of conservative mana bases, uh, Jeskai and Abzan, uh, meet in the finals. So the verdict's kind of still out on, yeah. on um, you know, do you splash the extra colors? Don't you? How many extra colors do you splash? What colors are you centered in? So I think we're going to see a lot of interesting movement as the metagame shifts around and players kind of jockey for position in terms of splashing extra colors and, and making movements to get access to certain cards. So I'm, I'm curious to see how things go forward from here. Yeah, something for you guys to think about at home as you decide what deck you'd like to sleeve up for standard as well. I can tell you that right now we are ready for the award ceremony here from Milwaukee. Let's send it over to Richard Hagen in the feature match area. Hello everyone and welcome to the award ceremony here at Pro Tour Battle for Zendikar in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We begin our ceremony with welcoming to the stage the finalist of Pro Tour Battle for Zendikar, winning 20,000 US dollars from Japan, Ryoichi Tamada.
A fantastic performance by Ricci. We'll see him again at the World Magic Cup in just a few weeks' time. But now it's time to welcome on stage your champion, winning 40,000 US dollars from Japan, Kazuyuki Takamura. Kazuyuki, congratulations. How do you feel? Uh, I like to go home and see my wife. Go home and see my wife. That's a great idea. Congratulations once again, the champion of Pro Tour Battle for Zendikar, Kazuyuki Takamura. We want to thank each and every one of you for being part of this amazing Pro Tour weekend. And that concludes the award ceremony here in Milwaukee. And thank you, Rich. What a great scene down there in the feature match area. Of course, uh, Kazuyuki Takamura getting that big check kind of floating out behind him as his friends and, uh, and, and testing teammates came out to, to cheer him on. So once again, I wanted to say congratulations to our champion from Japan, Kazuyuki Takimura. Great showing from him. That is going to do it for us here, though, for the weekend. First, I wanted to say thanks to you at home for hanging out with us. You know, this is all of our favorite game. It's one of our favorite things to do in the world is, is play and watch Magic, and we're really honored and happy that you took the time to hang out with us uh, throughout the course of the weekend to watch another Pro Tour go by. We truly loved it. Um, coming up, mm -hmm. GP Quebec City is next weekend. You're not going to want to miss that. And of course, we've been talking a lot about the World Magic Cup in just a, about a month and a half. It's, it's in early December, and uh, you're not going to want to miss that, especially with some of the teams. It's, we just saw Tamada kind of boost the profile of the already really highly boosted Japanese team. And, you know, we've talked about the U.S. team. And that's one of the cool, unique events. We're gonna, we hope that you'll be able to join us for that as well. That is going to do it for, for us, though. Again, I wanted to say thank you for joining us, and thank you to everybody here that helps make the event possible, the judges the event staff, everybody else on coverage. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you guys next time.